Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the Red Laugh Riot podcast. My name's Matt. And I'm Ben. Alright, Ben, do you want to do you want to introduce our first uh, segment of the day? Today, uh, that first segment is called Reading the Headlines. This is where we uh, go have a look at what the internet's talking about this week uh, by looking at the top posts on Reddit from this week and we read a few headlines. Um, and the first one's uh, a little bit um, bittersweet, I guess. Uh, the headline is, my fiancé left me earlier this month, so all the money I was saving for the holidays I spent on myself. And he's uploaded a photo of a Spider-Man PS4 edition PS4. So he's bought a PS4 plus the Spider-Man game, God of War, Detroit, Middle of Shadow War, Spyro Remastered, and Watch Dogs 2. <laughs> um, so a little sad but also get on him for going out of his way and just t- turning turning that into something he can make happy for himself you know yeah 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 sort of turning 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 yeah turning a bad situation into a good one eh <laughs> the top comment is someone saying i'll be your fiance <laughs> classic oh love it like in that situation right it's like you could wallow right and like i'm sure like the person's like gutted right like because obviously that's like a gutting thing to happen but mm. but at least they sort of be it's, it's good that they had the attitude of like oh well i've got all this spare money now may as well <laughs> spend it on myself yeah. like self-care that that stuff's important so good, yeah, on, good on them good on them well hold, hold your horses it's still not the most uh happy Still title. depressing. But anyway, this is from World News. Um, this is Auschwitz Museum on Latin America Migration. Quote, it's important to remember that the Holocaust did not start from gas, did not actually start from gas chambers. This hatred gradually developed from words, stereotypes, and prejudice through legal exclusion, dehumanization, and escalating violence. So this guy mm-hmm. um, from the Auschwitz Museum is comparing what happened uh, with the Holocaust to what's currently happening with the U.S.-Mexico border um, and kind of yeah. saying it doesn't just start at instant genocide, you know. It starts off with these uh, hate, with all just the general hatred and prejudice and all that kind of thing as well. And like he's saying, legal yeah. exclusion, like creating these boundaries between uh, U.S. and Mexico and not letting certain numbers of people in and that, that sort of thing. And, I don't know. Do you think mm. maybe he's jumping to a conclusion? Is is he kind of saying the U.S. is heading in a bad direction? What do you What do you think he's saying there? No, I I totally agree with him because you only have to look at history, right? To, I mean, there's a pretty good quote. It's something like, if uh, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something along the lines of um, those who like don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, mm, and if we look, true, yeah. if if we look. If we look through history, right, there's always been a group of people who have been um, basically made out to be the scrapgoat, right, of, like, all the problems, right? So, like, in, so, like, before World War Two, Depression era to into World War Two, it was the Jews. Then it was in, like, the 50s, 60s, it was communism. Then it was, like, um, you know, it's been, it's been the blacks at a certain point. It's been... Um, it's been Muslims, and now it's um, and now it's Mexicans. So it's it's constantly changing, and it's because like the people who run on those policies sort of run on fear, right? That's how they drum up their support. They run up they run up fear, and they say we should fear these types of people, um, mm. and then they push, and that's how they sort of get in as they get in, well, they get into power rather through through fear. Because it's much easier to control a population when they're scared than when they're not scared. Um, and there's some there's some very, very interesting research that shows that the more scared a population is, the more likely they are to vote for um, to vote right wing than they are left wing, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's sort of my thoughts on it. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, Ben, but I don't know too much about the current situation between the land border 
and like what the regulations are and all that but yeah i totally agree with the whole history thing we're like learning from your history like it just yeah it's kind of sad to see that that it, it does it does it does seem like people don't learn yeah <laughs> but it also yeah. in some ways seems like people don't care i feel like the u.s and trump are the kind of people that wouldn't care if they got into another war because some people like war there's a lot of profit to be made from war for some people you know yeah um, yeah so uh, that frightens me i guess to think that a lot of people value mm. other things ab above human life whereas in my opinion human life should be valued above above everything else um, yeah it's definitely yeah a thing of you know these certain people do value power and money greed over over human life but yeah i i definitely don't agree with with the way america's going about it and dealing with it um there has to be a better way i don't know what that way is but i really i really i really hope that that, that there is a better way um and then we find that way soon to you know sort of try and minimize human suffering yeah um yeah yeah well speaking of suffering yeah here's another sad headline <laughs> Stephen Heilenberg, creative SpongeBob SquarePants, has passed away. Um, so he was diagnosed last year um, with ALS. Oh, yeah. And yeah, just passed away this week. Do you, were you a fan of SpongeBob, Matt? I think when I was a kid, I, I think SpongeBob was sort of one of those shows, like it would come on TV and I'd sort of watch it. But I think I was usually watching it because something else was on after it that I wanted to watch. Oh, uh, okay. So I'd watch it, I'd watch SpongeBob, yeah. and then um, something else would come on and I'd be waiting for that other show to come on. Um, but I never right, like, okay. like I watched it, but I, I, I wouldn't say I was necessarily a, a huge fan of it, but I definitely didn't hate the show. For me, it was probably like the other way around. Like, yeah. Like for yeah. me, it was like, yeah. I, I turn on the TV to watch SpongeBob. And then if there was yeah. something on else after that, I'd also watch yeah. that. Like, right. I like, even if it was a repeat episode, I'd always watch it. Eh? Like every day after school until probably until like year nine or 10, I was still watching it. Like, mm. cause like, it's just so great. It's really great, especially those yeah, first few yeah. seasons. Those first few seasons of Comedy Gold, they just genius. Yeah, yeah. Because um, because because Heilenberg was uh, I think only like show running it or like in charge of it for the first yeah first three seasons I think plus the movie, and um, then after that point, right? Uh, I think he stepped away or something happened. I can't remember. And they had new people in charge, and I don't think it was as good. Yeah for the rest of those seasons and think maybe he came back for one of the later seasons i can't remember exactly mm. but yeah it, it finished after nine seasons a few years ago i think um yeah it's uh it's great it's just been i guess a huge part of my childhood and i've always i've always thought that it was like just great comedy great like yeah you know it's great that you can make great comedy with the children's show as well um yeah that's you know, true as well, and yeah. that there are some things that you find even more funny when you're older as well because it's not all just silly cartoony jokes you know a lot of it's quite smart yeah. humor as well or just totally random mm. the kind of humor you'd have in rick and morty but on a uh g rating <laughs> you know um yeah yeah kind of that random stuff it's just yeah it's great i've always loved it then you know, i haven't watched it in, yeah actually, no i was watching super episodes last year i think because i had a neon trial and they have it on there yeah yeah sad news i guess but um he i don't know how old he was actually I think he was only 50-something. Yeah, I, I don't think he was... Yeah, I want to say he was 50-something. He was 57. Jeez. Yeah, yeah it's um, sad, pretty yeah. young. Like, it's it's impossible to... to um, I think it's impossible to ignore sort of his impact on, on like, television and that, right? Like, like, SpongeBob is, like, an institution, right, of, like childhood and that right so like uh, there's definitely like a sort of sense of almost like i think for a lot of people of like the death of a little bit of childhood there right like um yeah yeah, yeah. I, like I, th I it's it's sort of w when it's anything pop culture related to childhood there's definitely a nostalgia factor um and all that so i think a lot of people take take that incredibly incredibly hard so yeah like uh, i absolutely a, a a huge loss in regards to pop culture and childhood especially was was Steve was Stephen a director or not or was he just I oh, was just an animator okay um he was I think he directed some things I'm not hundred percent sure did he direct did he oh okay um in that case <laughs> um going from <laughs> going from one director to other directors a um our next segment is top five directors uh this little segment is when we list our top five things on each topic each week so top five 
semi semi slash 10% inspired by a film called High Fidelity, where they make their own top five lists. Boom. Cool. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, Ben We're and I are gonna, are gonna name <laughs> our top five directors, and that's what we're gonna do. Boom. All right. Oh, um, yeah. I, I wouldn't assume have, I wouldn't I'm have figured that one out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a fantastic. Yeah. This is Ben. This was my best segue ever. All right. Don't take that, that was... away from me. Okay. <laughs> all right. We should just rename um, this podcast "The Art of Not Being Able to Do a Proper Segue." That's really yeah. all it is. Yeah. Trying to yeah. trying to find good segues. Oh well. <laughs> Go ahead. Give us your cool. give us your, your number right. five. No no screwing around uh, today. We're just gonna get straight into it. My number five is Pamela Fryman. So you're probably thinking, who is Pamela Fryman? And that's a good question. Um so Pamela Fryman is um, a television director. You see, I wanted to not just have a bunch of film directors and I also didn't want to have I see. just a bunch of um a bunch of males um unfortunately though i haven't watched okay so like my one of my major things more so with the film directors than the television directors was i made it sort of a thing that i had to have watched at least more than one of their films in order to qualify so i put that little like yeah. caveat on because because i like to make it more difficult for myself um that's what i like to do yeah so um pamela fryman is most well known for directing um, How I Met Your Mother. Um, in fact, she directed all but 12 of them. Um, so, yeah. All um, but, so, that's all but 12. all but 12 episodes? Yeah. That's insane. That's mad. Yeah. <laughs> I've never, seen it. I've never um, heard of anything like that on, on television. Like, normally yeah. every episode's directed by someone new, usually. Or, like, yeah. they rotate. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, so she directed... Her other work includes uh, two episodes of Friends. Friends, what a show. What else? Um, I'm just quickly going through. Um, Phasia, uh, Two and a Half Men, Mum, uh, One Day at a Time. Yeah, so she's 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 had a she's had a very successful career. But yeah, um, so that's my number five pick. Pamela Fryman, or also known as the director of How I Met Your Mother. Yeah, well, uh, I'll just say now, all, all of mine are film directors. Yeah, but yeah, it's because like I don't know why, but I, I guess I don't pay as much attention to the directors of TV. It's kind of harder yeah, to notice don't. because like usually yeah, like no, a totally whole good. TV show is kind of like consistent usually, and it's usually like the showrunner or the writers mm. that you might think about. Um, whereas yeah. with the director, like they have a specific style usually that you that you notice or a specific way of storytelling that you might uh, notice carries through all their films. So let's go ahead. My number five is a name that I don't properly know how to pronounce. Um, that's Dennis. Oh no. Villain. Ah. Oh, Villain yeah. you. <laughs> I'm really sorry, Dennis. That I don't know how to say your name, but it's it's a you you uh, you more than make up for the hard name with the beautiful films you've made. Um, so if you don't know, he's made uh, Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival, uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. And another film called uh, Enemy. He's done some other smaller previous work as well, um, some like foreign stuff uh, that he did before he got into Hollywood, I think as well. Uh, I haven't seen Enemy or Blade Runner yet for various reasons, uh, but the ones I have seen, like for example, Prisoners, one of my favorite films of all time. Yeah, mm. he's just he's got a real thrilling, like he makes really thrilling films. That's like one of the things that's like carries through Sicario and Arrival as well. They're so thrilling, like the whole way through. Like you're just kind of on your edge of the edge of your seat the whole time. It was Sicario, which is just like a story about, uh, like um, trying to uncover this drug lord or something like that. Anyway, yeah, yeah. like you, like it sounds like kind of boring subject matter, but like it just like carries you through. Yeah, that whole way. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I really want to see Blade Runner and Enemy, um, which I haven't done for various reasons. I was actually talking to Tash uh, last night about how I there are some movies that I've put off watching because I want to watch them on a proper surround sound setup. Because um, if you know, we talked about in a previous podcast about that cinematic experience, and there's some films that I just believe need that experience to be felt experienced yeah. properly. So that's why I haven't right. watched Blade Runner yet, either of the Blade Runners. Um, Enemy, I don't have as much excuse for, except that I just have never bothered because uh, I'm lazy. 
Uh, <laughs> so there you go, that's not my number five for now, and I'm definitely excited to see whatever he comes forward with in the future. I believe he's doing, uh, is it Rust or something like that? Some sort of video game based adaptation? I've forgotten. Oh, I think interesting. It's, is it Rust? June? Anyway, that's the next thing he's doing. So I'm sure I'll see it at some point. Um, that's that's what he's making. Um, yeah, uh, what's your number four, Matt? So my number four pick is David Fincher, um, who's a fantastic director. Yeah, he's got a very interesting style um, that I think is pretty easy to sort of pick up um, in terms of, like, yeah, like, actually noticing it, you know what I mean? Um, mm. So his films include Seven, Fight Club... Oh, Fight Club, which I'm pretty sure was on my top five list, or at least an honourable mention. Also, another one on my top five list was, I'm pretty sure, was The Social Network, um, which is another great yeah. film. Um, that was your number yeah, one, wasn't um, it? Yeah. I don't know. He's just... I really like his style, because um, like, a lot of the time it's pretty interesting, I find, because he sort of like shoots these shots, right? But like sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's like an actual shot or if it's been done like or if it's like cgi or whatever like i find that really interesting um also the fact that he doesn't really use handheld stuff except for in seven where where he where he did but yeah i don't know i f- i find it really interesting how he sort of like shoots his sort of style and how he approaches filmmaking i find really cool but yeah um David Fincher, my number four pick. Next on my list is, I'm sure, many people's favourites, uh, Quentin Tarantino. So, hey. of his films, I've seen Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, Glorious Bastards, Django Unchanged, and The Hateful Eight. I'm yet to see Death Proof and Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2. They're actually the last ones yet that I have to see. Um, I've actually kind of tried to space out my Tarantino viewings because, you know, because there's only so few of them, and I think he's only got two more movies to make uh, ever. Because he said he's going to stop at 10, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 9, 10. Yeah, if you, if you count Kill Bill as one movie. So the new one, which I think comes out next year, is uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I'm looking forward to. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, what to say about him? His writing's just so good. Like, just mm. I remember being in the theatre watching Pulp Fiction earlier this year, actually. And just, yeah, hearing that dialogue that he writes, it's just so, like, I don't know how to explain it. It's just so, like... Something I, I could have never imagined writing. It feels so real. It's so. It's also really clever, cleverly written and funny and everything. Um, same goes for Jackie Brown and um, and Res Dogs as well. Like the uh, the dialogue there is just like so clever. Uh, just they're all they're all fantastic movies. Um, not much else to say really. All right, so my number number three pick is John Hughes, who's sort of known as or what rather was known as a sort of focusing more on the teen drama as sort of his genre that he sort of stuck to. Um, in terms of films that I've seen by him, The Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink, First Bueller's Day Off, and Home Alone. So yeah, um, films that I've talked about before, I'm pretty sure. I don't know, he's just one of those directors where, like, he just makes really good films. Like, teen drama is sort of known as not very good, right? Right. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? Like, in terms of, like, genres, like, teen drama is probably, like, pretty low on, like, the list of, like, quality films. Well, I wouldn't say that. I think... Yeah? I think modern-day teen dramas usually are pretty bad. Um, but that's not yeah. reflective of the genre as a whole. Right. Yeah. Uh, I feel like if you think of, like, genres, right, like, teen drama and, like, maybe rom... You'd probably chuck rom-coms in there as well, usually known as, like, the lower quality of like of film maybe i don't know um but yeah I definitely i definitely wouldn't say that i would i'd say like maybe yeah? like in terms of the majority of them they're kind of seen that way name a good rom-com um i'll get back to you on that because i don't watch very many rom-coms yeah. so maybe i just don't have a good sample size there but i can definitely name obviously good teen dramas even recent ones edge of 17 is a, a favorite yeah. of mine. Sing Sing Street, if that counts as a team drama, as teens and as a drama, yeah, that counts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of good ones out there, but most of the mainstream ones that are trying, the ones that are trying to hit the current teen market, like specifically yeah. aiming for that, those are the ones that fail because all they care about is the money, and that's you never make yeah. a good product doing that. Um, so that's why most of them turn yeah. out that way. Um, yeah. yeah, with John Hughes, like, other than the one, like, like, John Hughes is sort of the opposite of what 
a lot of like mainstream mainstream films and teen drama like do right because he yeah because unlike like a lot of teen drama films like aren't realistic in how they sort of portray the high school environment and teens as a whole but like his his ones feel feel real you know they they feel yeah. real and they feel they feel human i feel like breakfast club is like a really good example of that um so yeah um i think that's all i have to say about john hughes but um yeah so that's my number th- my number three pick i'm like i'm gonna cut myself off <laughs> fair enough all right then um my number three another another favorite amongst many people i'm sure uh taika waititi um i've seen all his films ah. um i haven't seen oh, his wow. short films because you know i'm lazy uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah all his uh his feature films have been utter brilliance um it's, it's not much else to say about i mean like he's like he's not just a great comedian he's a great storyteller as well um and that's mm. what i love about uh eagle vs shark boy and hunt for the world people all have really great stories all the way through as well and quite emotional as well in some points so he's you know he's got that down and that's actually the reason i heard kevin feige who's uh, president of marvel studios saying one of the reasons he picked them out for thor uh, thor ragnarok which he did last year was um because he because he saw a boy and he saw how he could do comedy and emotion in the same uh you know in one film um mm. which kind of makes me a bit disappointed in what we did get with thor because he didn't write it he only directed it so really it was yeah. just his comedy coming through but because mm. i think he didn't write it there was still some uh lacking elements in terms of the emotion and the storytelling that was needed in that movie to make it even better um because it right. definitely lacked in those in those aspects for me and there were some moments a lot of a few moments where actually they kind of undercut the emotion with just adding a joke in there which was kind of unnecessary mm. which um i know i've heard a lot of people say that about the film um but i mean overall i'm very very uh, happy with the film i think it's quite still very entertaining um but yeah his other work i think is is more impressive in terms of uh, a film as a whole telling that story as well which is more important than anything else nice yeah and uh he's currently working on a film called jojo rabbit uh where he where he plays adolf hitler um um i think he's he plays sort of uh the uh, the imagination of a uh, moldy boys like a moldy boys imagination of hitler i think is what it is i'm not 100 percent sure don't really know too much about the film but um i'm certainly going to be in line to see it um it's probably going to be something like in the vein of the glorious bastards or uh, death of stalin so that kind of like comedy based kind of uh war based thing you know like in the war but it's also kind of, it's like a fictionalization of history that's kind of what i'm looking for yeah yeah yeah. So it should be something, uh, something along those lines, you know, obviously it is a comedy, primarily, probably. Um, yeah. yeah. So excited, excited for that. Sweet. Cool. So now we've hit my number two pick, and my number two pick is Richard Linklater, um, mm-hmm. who I think is a fantastic director. I really like his style. I'm a big fan of dialogue-driven films, you know what I mean? Like, where film, films that sort of don't, like, have much of a plot sort of thing, and it's more like... Yeah, it's more the dialogue that sort of drives the film. Um, in terms of films that I've actually seen from him, I've seen the Before Trilogy, um, so that's Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, and Before Midnight, as well as School of Rock, uh, which is probably his most like mainstream film, and obviously then there's Boyhood as well. I need to watch more of his stuff, um, but mm. I've yet to get around to it. I just like his style yeah. because his style is very much like based in like realism and just naturalistic like basically about people right yeah and like suburban culture and you know the passage of time and stuff like that i know which is which is really which 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 i i know i just i really like like his style of filmmaking Mm, so richard linkladder my number two pick yeah i i actually considered him for when i was putting my list together but i realized i've only seen boyhood and school of rock which you know i love both of those films but probably not enough to make my list or even the honorable mentions uh but um yeah moving on to my number two pete doctor who is currently the chief creative officer at pixar um he's been involved on a lot of their films he directed monsters inc up and inside out which are oh wow some of my some of my favorites of from pixar 
He was also had a, has a story credit on Toy Story One, Two, Four, and Wally. Um, so yeah, he's obviously he's hugely involved at Pixar, um, and I think has created some of the more some of the more emotional pieces um, from Pixar. And those three films that he directed, I think, are some of the best in terms of their emotional storytelling and what they have achieved on that level. I love Pixar, I guess, in general. Um, and I think he stands out to me as like having a lot of influence um, on the company and on what they do. Yeah, and like I said, just some, some really great emotional storytelling, which is what I love the most about Pixar, is they're not just kids' films. Like, okay, some of them are. A few of them are definitely cash-grab kids' films. But the majority of them uh true de- deep storytelling which i really admire um and like i said yeah, i think pete's one of the best at that um so now i guess it's your time for honorable mentions matt hit us with that list who are my honorable mentions my first one is edgar wright obviously a fantastic comedic uh comedic director and filmmaker um his style's really interesting especially you know his sort of like tendencies to cut really quickly and sort of you know create those like really interesting montages which we see in um i think the film's called in the world's end which i really like as well as Mm. you know his tendency to sort of cut to music which we which i think we see sort of throughout his films um but most notably um on baby driver just way back that film's cut to cut to the music is amazing another one um my other honorable mention is taki waititi who's an amazing comedic director who I love his work and sort of chucked him in there as well because obviously you gotta you got to check that Kiwi representation in there. Mm-hmm. And I, my other pick is Martin Scorsese, who's just, you know, one of those, what you know, just a god, basically. Yeah, it's just, you know, a, a guy who's made credible films throughout his career and a really interesting sort of style that he has as well. Uh, Christopher Nolan as well. He's sort of basically known for his, like, let's see how much we can, like, screw with your head sort of thing, um, which I also mm. really enjoy. Um, I think he sort of, like, with his filmmaking, sort of challenges the viewer and stuff to sort of be like, hey, you got to pay attention to this film, otherwise you're going to yeah. get lost. Um, yeah. Which, which, is, which is really interesting. And, yeah, for sure sometimes, you know, a lot of people don't like that. They sort of view filmmaking, um, well, not filmmaking, but view film as sort of a thing to like lean back and just watch and enjoy it and i mentioned it on the podcast before but i think those 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 films absolutely have value because sometimes you just need to just turn your brain off for a bit right. um but i think yeah. but i do think the films where you do have to work also have value as well my other pick is stanley kubrick who's absolutely was a fantastic director made some incredible films yeah, again, just another, in a similar vein to Scorsese being, like, sort of a god, really, in terms of his style of filmmaking and and all that. And my final honourable mention is a television director, because, again, I didn't want them to be all film directors. Um, I try and spice my top five lists up as much as possible. And that is, of course, Vince Gilligan, who's the creator of Breaking Bad. He, he I'm not sure the percentage of episodes that he directed of Breaking Bad was. Um, I remember it being quite high. I'm pretty sure he, a lot of the time, would direct the season premieres and the season finales. And those season premieres and season finales are like, pretty much every season was fantastic. So yeah, another another great director as well. If you haven't watched Breaking Bad, all of it, you need to watch it. It's fantastic. Oh my god. Um, yeah, so that's my honourable mentions. It's, it's funny, I think it's just going on that point about TV dragging itself on. I think it's quite funny because uh, two of your favourite TV shows, uh, both How I Met Your Mother and The Mentalist, I think, uh, both have, both I think, fell into that trap where they basically went as long as they could uh, before mm. they got cancelled. And then for their last season, they like wrapped it all up as quickly as possible or something, you know, or tried to extend it out as far as they could or, or you know and i feel like that was to yeah. their detriment i think if they had focused and just found out they're only going to do five or seven seasons for, in the case of how many mother i think it would have been better and they would have been able to create that ending a lot better because i think they both suffered in my opinion from endings that yeah. that were kind of too drawn out and then suddenly rushed at the end um in both those cases right. I think. yeah i think i'm one of the i think i'm one of the very few people in the planet who or at least with how i met your mother friends 
doesn't mind the ending of How I Met Your Mother. Um, and it's yeah. mainly because I watched a... Well, I didn't watch. I like, read an article that sort of had like a defense for it, which I sort of found interesting. It's not necessarily the, the ending for me. It's that whole season and final episode put together that don't mesh for me. That's really what it is. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I disagree. I found I found the season to be interesting and in sort of how they structured it. Mm, okay. Yeah. I think I think we did talk we did talk about this in episode two. I think. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to go back to remember yeah. what we said about it. Yeah. Neither do I. Yeah. But anyway, that's not what this episode's about. I've got a lot of honorable <laughs> mentions, so I should get into them. Um, <laughs> Speed round. So my... Lightning round. Uh, there's too many. There's too many to lightning this one. It's um, I mean, with film, you know, being such a a fan of film it's hard to narrow down a list so i just couldn't limit myself um but first off is peter jackson um i've only seen lord of the rings hobbit and uh, heavenly creatures there's a lot of films from him i haven't seen yet again because i'm lazy uh and haven't done that um next edgar wright as you said i've just seen hot fuzz scott pilgrim and baby driver some of my fave movies though um baby driver being my my number three if you can recall from episode one um next joe and anthony russo uh, who uh, have been Mar- uh, involved with Marvel Studios. They did uh, the second and third Captain America movies, as well as the most recent Avengers movies, and the next one that comes out next year. Definitely nailed those movies, uh, and the style of those particular films um, are like the best, most consistent Marvel films, I think. Yeah, they really absolutely nailed that. But all, um, they've also been heavily involved in Arrested Development and Community, which I've also talked about. They've directed so many episodes of Community, some of my favourite ones, and also quite a few a few uh, episodes of Versus Development as well, as I've mentioned before, a huge fan of. Uh, next is John Favreau. Uh, he's done some movies that I love. Elf, um, Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Chef, uh, which he directed on his own and starred in, uh, The Jungle Book, of course, and The Lion King, which is coming out soon. There was a trailer for that, which I didn't bother to see. He also did Cowboys and Aliens, which I haven't seen. And he also did uh, Zathora, which is like the space version of Jumanji. I mean, that film's okay for a kid's film, I guess. Like Alf and Chef um, and Iron Man are some of my, my favourite movies, so had to mention him. And I love him as a talent as well, because he's he's, he plays Happy Hogan in the Iron Man films. He's a great great character as well, I think, and a great performer. Uh, that, kind of, that kind of comedic, but also serious, like overly serious character that he plays in Iron Man. And he also plays a sim- not similar, but a similar kind of in that vein um, in Chef as well, which I like. Uh, David Yates, so he directed Harry Potter 5 through 8 as well as the two Fantastic hey. Beasts movies. Um, so he did, obviously he's done the best and the worst of the Harry Potter series. Um, <laughs> the worst being uh, Order of the Phoenix, I think, I have to say there. But yeah, his, his visual style that he brought to it was really, really cool, really good, and that kind of, yeah, I think really helped kind of aid the closing off of that Harry Potter series was really quite very well done I think he also did Legend of Tarzan Tarzan which I haven't meaning to see but never bothered to see um next Alfonso Cuaron I've talked about him because he did uh Gravity one of my favorite films uh he also did Prisoner of Azkaban the third Harry Potter film which was really like the one Harry Potter film that totally changed the series and brought it in a whole new visual style which was really cool but what he did with that film still easily one of the best movies from that series he's also done children of men which i haven't seen yet uh, and a new film coming out called roma uh which literally is in cinemas for a few days this coming week so i hopefully will go and see that um moving on to another couple of pixar directors we've got brad bird he's done the iron giant he did two incredibles ratatouille mission impossible ghost protocol which is the best mission possible i think uh and tomorrowland which i haven't seen uh andrew stanton who did finding nemo wally Finding Dory, John Carter, also co-directed Bugs Life, which I haven't seen. Uh, he directed two episodes of Stranger Things, uh, and he was a uh, co-writer on Toy Story 1 through 4 and Monsters, Inc. Um, so yeah, those three directors, uh, as I said, Pete Doctor, Brad Bird, and Andrew Stanton are really some of the three key Pixar directors um, that really put a lot of voice into those films and into that company. Next, uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Um, who directed Clatter with the Chance of Meatballs and the Lego Movie, as well as uh, 21 and 22 Jump Street. I haven't seen those two, uh, but those previous those animated movies they've done have been great. They were also originally the directors of Han Solo before they got kicked off for no good reason. And uh, lastly, J.J. Abrams is a bit of a favourite of mine. He's done 
the, the, the recent Star Trek movies, or at least the first two from the reboot series, as well as Star Wars Force Awakens and the third Mission Impossible. And he was oh, he also did Super 8, which I haven't seen. And he was quite involved with Lost, the TV show, as well. And oh, I haven't seen any of that, though. And, of course, upcoming Star Wars Episode 9, which comes out end of next year. Yeah, that's all That's all I've got for my own mention. Sorry, it's a long list. I just have a lot of things, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, can't, you can't blame me, really, surely. <laughs> no. No, no, you can't. Yeah. I was thinking we should play a game with this, with our number ones, because I think I've got a pretty good guess at who your number one is. Do you have any, a, do you think you might know my Do I have an idea? Of... Do you have any faint ideas? Oh. I I I I'm I'll be very surprised if you get my pick wrong. Okay. I don't know who yours could be. Well, I reckon we should message Tash with our You'll guesses, know. and then he'll tell us if we got it right after we've revealed. Oh well, we'll find out when we reveal if we got it right. I'm just gonna message him my my answer. All right. All I right. feel here's the thing. I feel like I know roughly who it could possibly be, but okay. I don't think I know their name. The, like, the types of people that I'm... Th- like, I can't narrow it down to, like, one person. I sort of have, like, a rough guess. Oh, Ben! <laughs> why did you do this to me? <laughs> well, then, oh. um, if you're if you're ready to move on, hit us with that. Okay, um... All right, so my number one pick, which shouldn't come as any surprise to to you, Ben, is Quentin Tarantino. Nailed what it. a director. A director... Yeah, I knew Nailed you'd it. know it. I knew you'd know it. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so obviously did Pulp Fiction, did Django Unchained, yeah. did Inglorious Bastards, did both Kill Bill, f- Kill Bill films, did Reservoir Dogs as well, did Jackie Brown. I think that's all of them that I've seen. I think. I'm going to say Seen Hateful Eight? No, I haven't actually. I've been meaning to, but have not gotten around to it. Yeah, um, I find his, his style very interesting, um, because he's one of those guys who sort of made, like, he's got, he's got a very distinct style to him, which I really enjoy. Yeah, and then, sort of like you mentioned, uh, Ben, in terms of his dialogue, is, like, rock solid, in my opinion. Just a director who, and I find it very interesting as well, because you can sort of tell with his films, like, how many films he's actually watched, you know what I mean? Because he sort of like he takes from right. everything, yeah, and yeah. sort of puts it all into into one. You know, mm. yeah, which, which which I find really cool and like really interesting as well. I mean, another good thing that he does really well is he, you know, his use of music um, is like fantastic. How he like picks sort of soundtracks and that, yeah, and just undertones his films absolutely perfectly. Just one of those directors who just has his like. Has has his finger on the pulse, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. So Quentin Tarantino. Um, All right, well, Ben. Case, what's your number it's one? It's time pick? for my number one. I feel like I don't. I have no idea if you would have guessed it or not. But it's Christopher Nolan. Ah! Oh! Did you guess it? Nope. Who did you guess? I whiffed it. I whiffed it. Um, I said I said maybe like Spielberg or or another Marvel director. <laughs> Was my guess. <laughs> I I don't, I've hardly seen any Spielberg movies actually. I don't think. Really? Um, and there there are aren't as many Marvel directors that have done a lot of Marvel. Like John Anthony Russo have done the most Marvel movies, and like as a single directing duo. The only mm. one who's done more, sorry, just as many would be John Favreau or Joss Whedon. They've done two each. James Gunn has done two. I don't think anyone else has done more than two though. But anyway, yeah, Christopher Nolan. I've seen all his movies. He's done like he's already done 10, 10, 10 movies in his career, and they're all really good. He's not got a single bad mm. or even moderately below it, like even slightly average movie. So, following Memento, Insomnia, The Dark Knight trilogy, of course, but The Prestige, Inception, Interstellar, and Dunkirk. There's nothing bad to say about any of these movies. To be honest, like they're all they're all really really good. His style is just so brilliant. I love the mind bending aspect, like you were talking about before when you're talking about him. Um, the mind-bending aspect yeah. you get in, especially, especially Prestige, Inception, and Interstellar, um, yeah. he's really, yeah. at, at that point in, in his filmmaking, you could tell he's really nailed it, really nailed how to mm. tell those stories in that way. Um, and the way he gets you with, like, in all three of those films, or at least Prestige and Interstellar, there's, like, the opening shot of the film 
is like a little hint that you wouldn't have even thought about that kind of is revealed later on to be like an important part of the plot that you wouldn't have, you know, um, it's quite yeah, an interesting yeah. way of filmmaking. And yeah, again, Memento is another one of my favorites for sure. And Insomnia. Insomnia I feel is underrated in some ways because it's a little less mind bendy. It's just more of like just a bit of a th- like thrilling kind of uh, psychological thriller, I guess. Because you're kind of like inside this guy's brain, just trying to like trying to deal with what he's dealing with, I guess. Because he's going mm. through like this real stressful situation, and like the film just feels stressful, I guess. Um, which is yeah, it's yeah. really well done. And following, which is it's quite a short movie. I don't think it's even ninety minutes long. Um, it's all in four by three and black and white. Because they filmed it over, I think, over a year or two, just on weekends when they had some free time, basically, they, they filmed that movie. And it's, it's still a very interesting, well-made movie. And you could see, actually, elements that he's taken from that film that he's put into uh, other films later, especially Inception. Because like the, one of the guys... Because um, one of the main characters in the film is a thief named Cobb. Um, and then in Inception, you have the main character being a thief named Cobb, um, which is I yeah. interesting. He kind of followed that through and took some ideas from his previous films, his earlier, more budget films, into his later films, which I think is really mm. well done. Um, and even Memento, which feels quite budget in terms of its uh, you know, cinematography and its um, editing as well, kind of feels it feels low budget a lot, but like it's still so fantastically crafted, the story. Yeah, nothing, nothing much else to say. I don't actually know what he's working on currently. I just can't wait to see more from him. Did you have anything more to say? Well, I think I covered. I think I sort of covered it all in um when I was talking about him in my honorable mentions um section. Yeah. But yeah, just a uh, a fantastic director for sure. An interesting thing though, um, I remember reading an article uh, about Christopher Nolan, and he was talking about the fact that he would never work with Netflix. What do you think about that? I guess it's he's very he's uh, similar to uh, Quentin Tarantino as well. He's very uh, like a, a, a man of uh, tradition, I guess, um, and a good reason, I guess. Like he really likes film, like shooting on film and the cinema yeah. experience, seeing a movie in a cinema. I also am very fond of. I'm fond of both of those things because film is definitely a higher quality medium than digital. It still is. But in terms of mm. the efficiency of it, you know, you can definitely see why everyone's switching to digital because it's much more efficient. You still get very high quality with digital. It's it's minor differences, really. I think in terms of the whole Netflix thing, it's quite funny because, I mean, because obviously he kind of is opposed to the digital platform, right? But yeah. um, I guess what he hasn't said is, I mean, that's, that's assuming Netflix asked him to make a movie. I wonder if he would be different about it if it was making a TV show such as, you know, something like Stranger Things, right? We make a mm. long form TV show, which is essentially a movie telling a story that way. I feel like he still wouldn't do it, but that's something I wish yeah. he might be more open to. Um, but I can see why he loves shooting on film and cinema. Like, cinema's, I think, really, really important. But yeah, it's interesting to kind of think about the way streaming services are run now and how much focus they have on, on original content as well. And I don't know, there's been like yeah. news just recently about how they cancelled Daredevil season, like after season three, which was like the best season um yeah and netflix has canceled that so i mean i uh, i'm pretty iffy about netflix these days i used to be quite on board with them back when they first launched yeah. in new zealand uh, that was three years ago though but since then they just keep dropping content and kind of recycling stuff they're not adding to the catalog so i kind of always thought that what they were doing was continuing to add to a giant catalog that would get bigger and bigger and bigger as they learned what people wanted to watch but they've actually just thrown mm. out a bunch of old stuff as well so they've kind of mm. not gained that big of a catalog the only reason honestly that i still subscribe is because i split it between my brothers so it's a, bit, it's a lot cheaper for us it's only just over five bucks yeah, yeah. A month for us or well, six dollars a month anyway yeah so I, I i wouldn't recommend anyone subscribe to netflix if they're paying it for them on their own because it's just not worth the price um for a serious lack of content i think a serious lack of content and the original content is mostly not that amazing they've got some real good standouts like stranger things and daredevil was amazing rest in peace uh but yeah i I, it's definitely an interesting conversation again considering all the other streaming services that are coming in i mean i don't know how much you are aware but there's been a lot even just recently even in the last week or so about netflix and 
Disney's streaming service, which uh, is meant to be launching next year. Yeah. You've got Hulu and Amazon Prime. YouTube was trying to play play the game, um, but YouTube just recently announced they're actually going to kind of stop doing their own original content, I think. Or at least they're going to stop making that under a paywall because they were trying yeah, to make it YouTube Premium. That. Or what, what, what was YouTube Red, uh, where they launched some YouTube Red original shows, uh, which, mm. you know, you pay for. You get the extra YouTube features, like you can play music in the background and all that kind of stuff. You can download videos. Um, and they also had original content, which was exclusive to those who subscribed. But uh, I don't think they had the numbers. I don't think many people are interested in subscribing to that service because it's really not that beneficial to most people. Um, and so yeah. they're trying to just subsidize. Now they're going to subsidize that content with ads um, and try and just keep doing original content, I think, but earn, earn the revenue through advertising as they do with every other video on the platform, obviously. But yeah, I don't know. What if, um, Do you have any comments on like on those streaming services? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add something um, to some of the questions that you were raising there, um, Ben. So firstly, yeah. Netflix have stated that they want to be a hun- to be making 100% um, original content by 2020. I remember reading right. an article about it. So that's, that's, that's one of the things of why they're wow. getting rid of old stuff. And it's secondly, atrocious. it's actually atrocious. And I secondly, can't that because that's Netflix has <laughs> never been that. Even from before they were yeah. streaming services, when they were when they were just DVD, yeah, selling, yeah. not selling, but uh, you would hire out a DVD and they would send it to you, right? Um, yeah. DVD rental services. Like, they've always been distributing other people's content, and that's what's yeah. made them so popular, right? It's a have. Yeah. It's the the reason you want Netflix because they have so much content. But if they don't mm. do that, if they're whittling it all down to exclusively original, I see no reason to be subscribing to them at all. That is just ridiculous that they would do that. But then, but then it doesn't make sense that they that they claim to be interested in original content and then they <coughs> cancel one of their best shows in Daredevil. I mean, with Daredevil, it's hard to say because it's because Marvel. I was like, yeah. Disney, well, Disney's now got their new service. Yeah. Disney's now uh, controls the majority of Hulu as well. So some mm. people are saying they're going to pick up the shows elsewhere, maybe pick up the Marvel shows that have been cancelled on Hulu because they could be on that platform. I don't think they fit the Disney brand, though, so they couldn't really be on the Disney sh- platform. But then they've also announced shows, like Marvel shows that are like in canon with the MCU, featuring Loki and Scarlet Witch, which are you know characters that I thought would kind of... Well, at least Loki, I thought we'd kind of seen the last of them, you know? Um but they're kind of going to revive that into a TV show, which, you know, there have been Marvel TV shows, but none of them have featured actual MCU characters, apart from Phil Coulson, who was killed in Avengers and then brought back to life in the TV show, and then very other very minor cameos from other characters. But for the most part, the TV shows so far haven't really been very well meshed at all in that universe, and kind of a lot of, there's even a lot of contradictory things, like even casting that's like, you have the same cast member playing two completely different characters within a TV show and a movie and stuff like mm. that goes on uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And so it feels, it's always it's always felt inconsistent, but now with the streaming service, they're trying to bring it in and kind of make that more consistent and have Marvel TV shows. I feel like Disney, being Disney, would rather do that than continue the Netflix shows. Um, so maybe that's why they've cancelled it. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe Netflix doesn't benefit from it because they're like, well... Disney controls it, so I don't know. Yeah, well, here's my here's my thoughts on it, right? It's yeah. So Disney has the rights to Marvel properties, right? So if Netflix was, if Netflix was going to continue to make it, mm. they would have to pay like royalties or something, or Disney would potentially just sue. No, would, I Disney think Disney well, would potentially just yeah. sue for their content. Like from a bit again from a business perspective, right? It's. I think Netflix cancels it because they know that th- they basically don't want to deal with the with the legal implication the legal implications of it. Like it's an obvious play for Disney to sue, and they've been known to sue in the past. So I don't think they would be they would be below. I don't think it's a situation where they could sue, because I mean, there's like they had a contract like Disney and Marvel and Netflix signed a contract five years ago or four years ago. To say mm. that we we're going to have a certain number of series, I'm not hundred percent sure how many seri- how many seasons that was in that contract, but there is a certain number, I believe, that Netflix was licensed to do, so they can continue right. to make those. Um, but I'm not hundred percent sure if that means they can renew the seasons for as long as they want or not. I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah. I just don't know what this is dealing with. I don't think 
I don't think anyone actually knows how it's working, but obviously yeah. they wouldn't sue, like, because Netflix would obviously never do that. They would never do anything where Disney could potentially sue them, because yeah, either they pay a license or they just don't have the rights anymore. Um, yeah, and then Disney takes it over. But it's also the question of whether or not Disney will bother. I think I don't know. Right, it's really unclear. But it's because they're not part of the Marvel brand as much. Yeah, I would imagine it's it's purely an executive decision, right? It's. Disney have the rights to it, right? D- Disney are the ones who have the control over it, right? So it's basically it's their business sure. whether they whether they do it. From Disney's perspective, it would make sense to carry on that content. I would argue it would make sense for yeah. them, right? Because it's more it's more content, it's more content on their yeah. platform, right? They'll get some yeah. people who are potentially on net, potentially subscribing subscribing to Netflix, right? To jump over to the, yeah. to the Disney service. That's true, yeah. So I'd be very surprised if they didn't continue it. I'd be very surprised. And the reason I'm unsure about it, though, is because it's not a very Disney-friendly show. Mm. Daredevil, Jessica Jones, right. they're, they're, quite, they're very R-rated, you know, um, which I don't know if Disney's interested in that or not. But then again, in the past, Bob Iger, who's the CEO, I think, of Disney, has said they're not opposed to doing R-rated content, such as doing a Deadpool movie. So maybe, maybe they will put it on their service, or they could do it on Hulu, like I said, because they do own... After having purchased Fox, they own the majority of Hulu now as well. But the only, the only thing about that is that Hulu's only in the US. So that's the really annoying thing is that I really hope that they expand Hulu internationally if they're going to do something like that, right. like put all their content on there. And also, I'm really sure, I'm pretty sure Disney isn't dumb enough to make their service, their Disney service, exclusively in the US. That would be pretty dumb um, because you're missing out on like a whole 50% of your pot of your potential. Of your market, um, yeah market absolutely it would be dumb of them not to roll it out internationally from day one i think it needs to be international otherwise they're not going to make the big splash that they that they want to yeah um yeah i've always been frustrated with services that are u.s exclusive i mean it's hard to find reason for it i think it's because the laws in terms of broadcasting rights and stuff is so archaic and based on back when we physically had to broadcast (laughs) when we physically had to broadcast things um you know through the air and yeah. then you'd have to send you'd have to send tapes physically to ship them to, to the other country or you'd have to do an over the year broadcast to that network overseas to give it to them as well. So there's kind of reasons why they have those laws in terms of the rights there, but it's just so unnecessary these days. Everything just should be international. It's frustrating that the kind of Yeah you know, we're in this age where you know, almost the golden age of streaming, but the broadcast rights system is still back in the nineties. You know? Yeah, 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 it's outdated for sure. I okay. Wait, here's a question. So, I think it was this year or might have been last year or something that the most nominated, um, the network with the most um, nominations was Netflix. At right. the um at the Emmys, so that's like, I think that's sort of a huge sign in terms of the future of video streaming and sort of like TV, well, traditional TV rather, sort of losing its footing more and more and more. What's what's your sort of take on that? Yeah, I think, well, for sure they're taking over. Mm. And it's like that's been, you know, since Netflix kind of became popular a couple of years ago, you could see that that's where the industry was going to head and that networks need to catch up. <coughs> Sky, um, yeah, you need to <laughs> catch up because broadcast is dying. It is dying. Yeah. A painful slow death actually it's not even that slow to be honest it's happening quite quickly and these networks that aren't catching up and aren't providing quality streaming services of their own they're, they're going to be left in the dust i think tvnz's done the best here in new zealand um they've got in terms of the under on-demand service i think they've got a good on-demand service mm. i don't know how much original they're doing small amounts of original content not like major productions in terms of exclusively for streaming anyway. Yeah, again, the other options. Um, Lightbox is a New Zealand one as well. I don't. I haven't really used it. Um, yeah. That's owned, by, that's owned by Spark, I think. And then, of course, you've got Neon, which is run by Sky, uh, which is uh, really terrible. It's got a really terrible user experience. Um, and they just, I don't know what they're doing trying to hang on to this broadcasting. I think, that, honestly, the only reason they made Neon is so that they'd have a place to put that content uh, that mm-hmm. they own. But they're trying to advertise it like it's this big, cool thing that everyone can use. But it's, it's a really bad service, and they need to step up that game. 
because again, like I said, everyone's moving forward into streaming, and if they don't, if you don't have a solid streaming platform, you're not going to survive. You know, no one's going to want to subscribe to your content, to your service. Mm. Um, that's why Amazon Prime is one of my favorites because it's way cheaper. They, funnily enough, they went international when the Grand Tour came out. Uh, now two years ago, I think. Um, because they had such a huge international market for that show, they're like, we need to be ready to launch internationally. So that's what they did, and I'm really happy that they did that. And it's way cheaper. It's like four fifty New Zealand a month, as opposed to Netflix like twelve to fifteen dollars or something. Uh, Neon's ten to twelve or something like that. I don't know what Lightbox is like. That's I think one of the best services. And they've got a, they've got plenty of good content as well. Um, that I haven't watched too much of it, but they've got plenty of original content and licensed content as well. I think, personally, it's really important to keep licensed content, not just original content, because not everyone who creates content is going to have their own streaming service to put it on, you know? Um, mm. Obviously, Netflix is going to lose all the Fox and Disney properties that they would have had otherwise, which are going to go on the streaming service from uh, the Disney Plus service, right? But there's still plenty of other films that aren't attached to another streaming service, or aren't attached to a studio that has one, that could still remain on Netflix, you know, um, especially in terms of television, yeah. because when it comes to, for example, let's just say, for example, How I Met Your Mother, take that show, um, which is run by a US network. I actually don't know which one. NBC, I think. Is it NBC? Okay. Even if NBC had their own streaming service, which they, I assume they have an on-demand service that's only available in the US because of those broadcast rules. So the only way to get that show out internationally on a streaming service is to license it to it place like netflix um Mm. so even if netflix doesn't have it in the u.s if they have it everywhere else that's great the same goes for like rick and morty for example because adult swim in the u.s are the only ones who broadcast that or have it on their website but everywhere else uh, internationally it's on netflix because um that's the only place we can see it no one else and if netflix is trying to drop their licensed content then i guess they're going to have to let that show go for example and give it to amazon prime or or someone else who's willing to take it which I think is a really dumb move by Netflix. I mean, they actually, funny enough, for season three, because they got a day and day um, release of it, so every every episode came out the same day it did um, on Adult Swim, they had a Netflix logo in the start. Uh, they claimed it's cause, because it's a Netflix exclusive, I guess, so they had their own logo at the start of it, which well, it seems dumb to me. Um, but, I mean, is that does that count as original for them? I don't know, because it's definitely not... I mean, I wouldn't call it original, but they kind of kind of try and show it off as if it is because they've got their logo there. Yeah. This, I, I think it's a dumb idea for them to lose all their licensed content. I think, I don't know. I don't, maybe they're not going to fail, but they can become, become far less popular, I think. Yeah. Because their original content is not, I don't think it's enough for them to survive. Yeah. Or at least to remain like the head of the, because at the moment they're like the top of the top in terms of streaming services, but I think they're going to really yeah. well down in that ranking. I think Amazon and Disney are both going to well overtake them. If um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, Disney doesn't need to license content because they have so much original content already. They can just put it on there. That's how they're going to they're gonna win. And Amazon, of course, they've got heaps of licensed content, but they kind of have to because they don't have that much original content. So I think both of those will overtake if Amazon sticks with their licensed content and maybe steals some of the stuff that Netflix is dropping i think would be good yeah i mean disney is gonna i think i think disney's um streaming service is gonna be hugely popular so yeah i'm sort of surprised that disney sort of didn't make their own service like sooner you know what i mean i think it's because they're working on it they want to make it really good and i think it is they've been working on it for a long time um right and I think they want to just have a huge launch with all this original content, like, for example, those new Marvel shows and Star Wars shows that they're doing. They're doing, you know, they're doing stuff with Taika Waititi and John Favreau on, on their network doing Star Wars stuff as well. Yeah, so I think they're going to kind of wait until they've got all that stuff that they can launch with, and then they could just be like, bam, instantly. Everyone just subscribes, and they have all this content, like, just immediately. Whereas if they made the service two years ago, it wouldn't be... Ha- it wouldn't be as developed. It would be, you know, because even like Amazon Prime, the UI is not that great. You know, I think Netflix has the best uh, user interface. Um, yeah. There's still a lot to be desired in terms of the stupid autoplay trailers and all that kind of stuff. But I think Disney's really working on that user experience. At least I hope that's what they're doing. Because um, if they're not, uh, who knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, so they, I think they're really focusing on making the platform 
a user friendly, really good, decent platform to be on, as well as focusing right. on the original content which they want to bring in. And of course, this whole thing with Fox that they're bringing in, they're going to have so much more content. So they obviously want to have all that ready to go as well, I think, mm. before they launch, if they can. Do you, yeah. like, what are your thoughts on, in terms of the actual number of services available? Like, do you think there's too many, or do you think it's like a good amount? Like, in terms of like Ooh. having to pay for all these services? I mean, because we're, we're, we're at a point where like, there's more content than ever, right? So you're going to, mm. like, it's it's unavoidable. You're, you're going to miss out on content. But I mean, yeah, I I I vaguely remember watching either either a, a video on YouTube about it. Sort of with Disney's arrival, it's gonna like we we're gonna see a very interesting thing I think happen to the market. There's gonna be like so much competition that it's gonna become more and more difficult to to sort of like choose which service to to subscribe to and to watch. It's interesting because like from my point of view, right, I. Like, sure, I enjoy Netflix original content, but, like, most of the time I'm, like, searching for a specific show or a specific film that I want to watch. So, like, subscribing to a service and not being sure that that service has that type of content, I think it's going to become more and more difficult. Do you reckon some services like Netflix might do, like, separate packages, like, for separate genres of content? Because not everyone wants all those genres... Because even recently they um they started like a Facebook page I think called NX which is kind of meant to represent all the fantasy and sci-fi genres, like and right. I'm kind of wondering if that's like a precursor to having a separate NX package, which means you can only watch those genres because some people might only go for those shows. Do you think that's something that could be a good idea for them to do? I find it easier. If it's like you pay for it and then you have just 100% access, like I prefer that than paying for like individual packages. But like if there's a cheaper option and if you only wanted that kind of, if you only wanted those sci fi shows and you could get it for cheaper, mm. why wouldn't you? You know? I would potentially argue that it's probably more worth it to pay that little bit more to have that more choice, to have more choice. Because like sometimes yeah, I'll sort of give it sure. a go to sort of dip my toes into other genres yeah i mean that's that's based on the type of person you are and the type of content yeah. you want to watch though isn't it? yeah um, yeah someone else that might not be the case mm. so i think that could be a good option for netflix and it could be what they're doing yeah from a i mean you know the fact of the like from a filmmaker's perspective right because we're both filmmakers like i 100 percent believe that you should support filmmakers right and like like filmmakers should be content mm. creators should be should receive re, should receive money for their work right and so with these streaming service with with the plethora of streaming services coming out it'd be interesting to see if that what impact that has on illegal streaming yeah i think it has had an impact i think less people are less people yeah the pirate stuff now because it's actually easier to get it legally now and it used to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, for most things, now I think piracy comes down mostly. It's um, people who just can't be bothered paying the money, or they can't afford it. Who yeah. Are, um, who are pirating nowadays? Less so than <laughs> in the past, where it was just like, well, it's too hard to get it legally. Yeah. In, in some cases, it is. In some cases, still, there's shows that you literally can't get legally. So. Yeah, 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 you yeah. Find which is a big thing as well. It's like, oh, well, I'm subscribed to the service, but I can't find what I want to watch, therefore I'll watch it, yeah. I'll stream it illegally. I've always it's, a, been, it's a very common... I've always been hugely understanding. Um, I think I talked about this previously. I think I've always been hugely understanding of people who pirate television because the system's so broken. Uh, but I can't mm. say the same for movies, and really I don't think anyone has an excuse to pirate movies. The distribution system for movies is perfectly adequate. It's so easy. Yeah. So, so easy. I, th- I think as a blanket statement, we should both say, as, I, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think as, as a company, we should say that we, we do not condone piracy. And and I think one of our major things is support support creators, guys. If you want to see more content, you should support it, especially if it's the type of content that you that you enjoy. That's, that's what I love about like the YouTube platform and stuff like that. Like, yeah. I love how creators online especially can, can do that and can gain their following and make their living off that 
I think it's really mm. cool that that's a possibility now for people like us as well. Yeah. And that there are people willing to pay money for it, you know, because that's why we have Patreon and stuff like that. There are people who make money based on Patreon in as well. Because yeah. YouTube ad revenue doesn't cut it. Um, yeah. There's also YouTube introduced the system of uh, memberships, which is like a five dollar yeah. thing. Where you, it's kind of like Patreon, but for YouTube channels as well. So it's cool yeah. that we have that option, which is something that you know people wouldn't have dreamed of ten or twenty years ago. Mm, very true. Well, um, yeah, I mean that was definitely an interesting discussion on the, uh, the streaming services that we have. Well, I guess it's time on to move on to the next segment of the show, which is what you doing. Which is, of course, where we talk about what we've been doing, reading, watching. Um, usually on a streaming service, probably, isn't it? Um, yeah. So what I have been doing, what did I watch? Actually, no, this one wasn't on a streaming service. This was in cinemas. I went to see uh, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. Oh, wow. Uh, did you get to see it, Matt? No, I didn't get to see it, and I'm did very you? mad. How was mm, it? What, yeah, what did well, you think? Yeah, without saying too much. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, I first I'll give a funny story about what happened. So I turned up to the theater at about three thirty-five p.m. Uh, to try and get to the showing that was at, that started at three thirty. I was like, "Hey, can I get a ticket for the three thirty session?" She's like, "Yeah, all good. It should still be in the ads at the moment." Gives me a ticket, says, "Yep, uh, go ahead. It's in Cinema Six. So this is at Event Albany. Um, so I walk up into Cinema Six and I get in there. I'm probably there about ten minutes after it started." I get in there and it's all dark and the movie's already playing and I'm like, oh crap, I'm quite, I'm quite late. Um, I thought the ads would go longer than that, but they must have had short ads today. So I get in and I sit down and it's like, I have, my first thought is like, oh, this is, this must be the start of the movie, but it's quite a bold, interesting start to the movie. And then it moves on and about five minutes in, I'm hearing the, the way the shots are like clo- a lot of close ups of, of main characters, a lot of main characters that we haven't actually really been introduced to yet and the music's kind of swelling up in this kind of emotional climactic way and then something quite uh devastating happens to a main character and i'm just like hold up this isn't right i'm not in the right theater oh, <laughs> Turns no. out i was watching i was i was i was watching the end of the movie <laughs> i was like shit uh walked out of the theater and I looked at my ticket, and it was for a 4.30 showing. She'd given me the ticket for the next showing, which was in that theatre. Oh. So I had to walk down and find the next theatre, which was playing it, which was in, like, Cinema 5 or 4. Walked in there, uh, and they were still playing the ads. <laughs> uh, and so I saw the whole movie from start to finish. Oh, uh, I'm glad it worked out theater. for you. But that was just the funniest thing ever. Uh, yeah. and I was just cracking up just while they were playing the ads I was still cracking up over it I'm sure everyone near me was like what's this guy laughing at like what a weirdo um, <laughs> yeah it was it was kind of frustrating um, but 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 I got to see the movie in the end um, and yeah I think it had a it had a quite a strong opening I think but what I would say about the movie is it's really just a lot of entertaining sequences that really don't mesh together all too well or mean much if anything at all yeah it's kind of um like i was certainly entertained i would say i was entertained the whole way through but not because it was an intriguing and great story right mostly just because it had it had some cool scenes i guess and so cool it has great characters yeah i think newt's commander again is a fantastic character dumbledore was quite interesting i really like i did like him I think Grindelwald's really good as well. I think Johnny Depp's really great. Other ca- the other main characters from the previous movie definitely take a back seat. They're definitely not nearly as important, and their story's not nearly as interesting either. Um, mm. So I wasn't as interested in those, but they're certainly the main characters, Newt, Grindelwald, and Dumbledore, are all very interesting. Um, yeah, and, and there's a couple of other characters in there which are interesting as well. But there's a, that's another problem I think a lot of people were saying is that there's so many characters with so many thin storylines. Um, yeah, that kind of it just spread out. It's like like butter spread over spread over too much bread. Who said that? Right. Somebody said that in some movie. That's a, that's a quote from something. Um, might be Lord of the Rings or something. Uh, but yeah, it's yeah. um, yeah, that's what I feel. It feels a lot like the, actually the Hobbit movies, in terms of like it being a prequel series that's kind of trying too much to link itself into the previous films because there's right. so much. It's like so many characters. And so much influence that it feels like it's trying to just be more Harry Potter 
instead of being its own thing, it's trying mm. to just take too much influence from characters from the previous films that we've seen. I think um, that's a huge problem from it. And also, I think J.K. Rowling's kind of too involved, I think. I think right. uh, she's got too much influence on it and doesn't isn't quite as experienced in filmmaking as she is in book writing, you know? And I think it's quite a different medium and the, the writing doesn't work the same way. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's a big problem. Yeah, that's really... I don't want to say too much. That's kind of all I got to say. Ben, yeah? um, I have a question because one of the major uh, things I've heard was that the film was basically described as just being... As bas- like one of the major criticisms that people had for it was that the film comes across as just f- as being filler. Like it's like, we need this film so then we yeah, can get well, to this film. It's sort of... That's the major yeah, criticism. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. Do you, do you, do you, do you agree with that confu- or, or not? I do. I, I do, actually, yeah. Because it was so long and didn't span much time. And, like, it only takes place, like, six months after the previous film. But when this film series was first announced, they said there were going to be five movies, and it was going to take over place, take place over, like, a period of five to ten years or something. And the right. second movie is still only six months into that period of time. You'd think they'd have moved on or jumped further ahead. But, I, yeah, exactly. It does feel like a setup. They're huge. They're just trying to set up this whole... It's, it's strange because it started off as Fantastic Beasts with, with Newt's Commander and obviously Fantastic Beasts, um, and it's turning into Dumbledore versus Grindelwald. That's clearly yeah. where it's going. And even in the first movie, you could sense that that's what they were trying to set up for, and now that's basically all it's going to be from there out. So, like, the second movie, I think still... It has a lot of Fantastic Beasts in it, so I think it still works with the title. Right. Going forward, though, I don't know how they're going to keep that up because going yeah. forward, it seems like they're going to... If they're going to have more beasts as quite a focus or quite main points in the future films, or if Newt is still a main character, it's going to be quite confusing. It feels like it's going to be forced, as opposed to this natural Dumbledore versus Grindelwald thing, which they could do. Yeah. I feel like it's going to be a weird kind of... But from the perspective of Newt's commander, which is yeah. going to feel weird, because... They've just got two completely different stories to tell that they're trying to do in a single series. I think the character of Newt and all these other main characters that we've met were really cool and could have made a great series standalone. And then the whole Dumbledore, Grindelwald thing, it just is kind of on the... It should be either on the side and the background, but not like... I don't know, the way they're doing it, trying to make it the main plot of all the series, is just like... Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to understand why they've done it that way. Um, yeah yeah i i'm i'm i definitely the thing is if the next movie is no good it's done the whole series is done the next movie has to be good and they really have to rethink their strategy in terms of the way this storytelling is mm. going to happen because it, yeah the next movie will be make or break i think um for the whole series i think that's all i've seen this week other than obviously all the fantastic two and four projects that we saw at school um I can't really say too much about them because no one else would know what we're talking about, but there was some <laughs> really fantastic films. Yeah, um, there was. Yeah, there was. I was really, was really happy with uh, those screenings. And in terms of what I want to watch, I I do have a list, and there's a certain things that I, I'm going to try and force myself to watch. Um, one, the first one is Game Night, which came out earlier this year, and I found it on iTunes because it was cheap. It was cheap, 99 cent rental. I was like, I'll sneak that one. And hopefully watch that. Um, but also, uh, one film that's I've seen pop up on Netflix called Overlord, uh, which is co-produced, I think, by J.J. Abrams. It's got Chris Pine in it, and it's... Uh, I don't know too much about it. It's like a med- medieval kind of age film. Uh, I don't know what it's really about. So I just thought that looked interesting. I might watch that. And then now that I've gone through my favourite director's list and seeing what they're kind of what they have done that I haven't seen and what's coming up, I kind of need to put that on my list. So Enemy yeah. by <laughs> Denis, uh, Dennis, whatever. <laughs> Villeneuve. 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 That must be right. Villeneuve. Yeah, that sounds Dennis right. Villeneuve, sorry. Anyway, uh, so Enemy, uh, Children of Men by Alfonso Cuaron and also Roma by Alfonso Cuaron, which is in cinemas this week, which I think I might go to if I can snag me a ticket yeah i'm gonna try and watch those if i can because now that i'm finished with film school i'm not so mentally uh um busy 
you know yeah even though i am working a bit this week um I'm doing, you know, you know, similar hours or not quite as many hours probably than what I would do at school. Uh, once you leave work, it's not as, you don't have to think about it all the time. Whereas at, at school, you're always thinking about it really. Although I do have some, a little bit of school work to finish up on this week. So I'll get to finish up that. But yeah, those yeah. are, those are the things I hopefully will watch this week or next week. Yeah. Going forward. Um, what do you got for us, man? So... I've been once again quite slack because I've sort of been um, sort of similar vein to you, um, Ben, in terms of been enjoying all those term four projects um, at school, um, and there were some some fantastic um, ones in there. Differently, um, some very some very very talented people, um, and I'm sure, well, at least I hope that um, that their work will be you know seen by um, more and more people. Mm. So yeah, in terms yeah. of things I have watched, um, so I started watching it again. Um, a TV series called One Tree Hill. Uh, no, not One Tree Hill. Sorry, um, the OC, which is basically an old teen drama, teen drama from like the two thousands. I I would describe it as it's not like groundbreaking television. You know what I mean? Like it's not like incredibly yeah. good. I wouldn't sure. say it's what you'd expect from from a teen drama. You know what I mean. So I've sort of watched yeah. like an episode or two while I've while I could. You can you can miss it. You know what I mean. Like it's it's a series that like if you haven't watched it, you're not really missing out on much. Um, is sort of how I'd explain it. But you're watching it again for a second time. No, I'm so I I, I was watching it and then I stopped watching it and then I've started watching it again. Oh okay. So I've gone oh, back I see, to I see. it. Um, to sort of see if I can finish it. But to be honest, there's a good chance I'm going to give up on it again because <laughs> I feel like it's not very good. Well, like, it's right. not... Well, not that it's not good. I think it's there's better content out there, right? And, like, because I've talked yeah, about it before totally. in terms of, like, the amount of content out there, I may as well look at content that's, like, actually good. Um, so the other thing that I've um, done is I've been listening... Um, uh so in terms of one of my music picks is a song called life i choose by bizanji um so it's a rap song i oh, know i really like it it seems like a very good hype yourself up song you know so yeah i really dig dig that song it's funny how i actually found it because i found it as like an introduction to like a youtube video and i oh, really okay. and i really liked it and i was like hey that's a good song and so i was like trying to search the lyrics and I found it, and I was like, hey, that's the song, and I was very proud of myself when I found it, um, because it was a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be, and then my third pick is, well, the music video actually came out to, um, Arona Grande's Thank You Next, and so I've watched that, um, <laughs> music video, like, once or twice, it's a good music video, um, because it's like, <laughs> it's, no, no, hear me out, hear me out, because it's, it's right, got like a bunch right. of re- it's got a bunch of references to like films and stuff like there's heaps of references to Mean Girls which is that which is a really good film if you haven't seen Mean Girls you should actually watch it because it's a, it's actually a really good comedy yeah. and it has a bunch of other references to like pop culture um like films and that um and it's also a really good song I think that's it for the stuff I've like watched slash, slash slash listened to um this week sort of been a quiet week because of the fact that I've been that 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 we've been doing stuff with uni um however I still have work to do with um with uni stuff need to finish some stuff off yeah that that's going to be a thing for next week as well in regards to um th- ha- however hopefully I'll be sort of freed up a bit um and therefore can work on well and therefore can like watch some stuff as well uh, i don't even know what i need to watch anymore because there's so much stuff that immediately comes to mind is i do want to see the second fantastic beasts film sons of anarchy tv series that's been on my list for a while um as well as just like a plethora of other films so hopefully i'll be able to see like one or two um in the week and then i can sort of talk about them so yeah, yeah. That's um that's all the stuff that I that I that I want to watch. Cool. Well, um, in that case, uh, we'll move on to the next section of the show, which is the crunchy comics section, which um 
now three or four weeks in a row has been fairly empty. Um, yeah. Because for some reason, no one's joining on the live chat anymore. We used to have a few people in the live chat, um, and now it seems like nobody's joining in, which is kind of sad. So if you're listening to this and you're like, wait, I don't know, there was a live chat? Yeah, we actually broadcast this uh, this podcast live. Um, usually every week, a Sunday or a Saturday, usually Saturday morning-ish. It's kind of inconsistent, but of course it'll be posted <laughs> on our Facebook pages. And if you subscribe on Twitch and you get the notification, you'll see when we're going live. And you can join in on the chat there and listen to everything, the whole thing, unedited, which is lots of fun. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but other yeah. than that, if you're listen, if you're listening after the fact, you can still comment everywhere else: Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, all those places. Give us a comment, question, anything at all. We'd love to hear from you. Although worth noting, uh, today is actually our last podcast for what we're calling season one of the podcast, <laughs> and the hope is the hope is to come at come back at you next year with season two with um hopefully. A nicer setup, um, maybe some better mics, and a bit of a space for ourselves to to do this podcast a bit a bit more professionally, I guess, um, and get better content for you, um, yeah, the lovely listeners. Um, so yeah, I'll add to that in regards to um, uh, equipment and that if you um, if you can afford it and and want to see us making better content, please feel free to head over to our Patreon page. Um, you can support us on Patreon. Any money that's placed on Patreon will be invested back into the company by um, buying better equipment, whether that be mics or um, maybe down the line cameras, potentially renting a space um, if we get enough money. And therefore, um, that will result in better content for you guys. We want to make more types of content other than just podcasts. Um, however, we need to get the equipment first, um, so any financial support will be greatly appreciated. Um, however, if you can't afford that, like Ben said, please check us out on our social media um, pages. Share us around, please. Tell us, um, tell your friends about us, because we want to build an audience. And please comment. Um, so yeah, that's season one of the Red Life Right podcast done. My name's been Matt. And I've been Ben. See you next year.